or yeah. What a lying lion looks like. Say that ten times fast. Yes. What a lying lion looks like. First Peter chapter five verses six to eleven. First Peter five six to eleven. So humble yourself under the mighty power of God, and His good time, and in His good time He will honor you. Give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares about what happens to you. Be careful. Watch out for the attacks from the devil, your great enemy. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for some victim to devour. Take a firm stand against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering as you are. In his kindness, God called you to his eternal glory by the means of Jesus Christ. After you have suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. All power is his forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we look at your word, I pray, God, you will just draw us closer to you, Lord Jesus. And I pray, God, you will just open our eyes to all that your word says. We give you the glory and the honor in Jesus' name, Lord. And I pray, God, for myself, as i got VBS so much on my mind, I pray, God, you just help me to be able to hear from you, Lord God, and speak your word in Jesus' name. Amen. This week has been so much VBS focus that it's, it's, it's um, easy to get distracted. So, Lions, just like house cats, like to lie around. They like to sleep, they like to lounge, they like to slumber. And I was trying to figure out why. Why do, lion, why do cats sleep so much? Because we've got two of them and they're always asleep somewhere. And never with, never with each other. They might sleep on Danny's bunk bed, one on the top bunk, one on the bottom bunk, or five or six feet away from each other, which I guess is how they visit. But um, they, they sleep. They sleep all the time. And yet, when um, Danny and Melissa were out last week, the cat was sound asleep in my lap. And all of a sudden, the cat put his head up and started looking at the front door. And a, But a minute later, the front door opened, we can, Danny's car is practically silent, and yet the cat heard the, door, the car pull in the driveway and knew that they were coming in the door because he heard the car. So they're never actually asleep sleep. They're just looking like they're asleep because they're still listening all the time. Cats are just lazy. But apparently what it is is because ones that live in the wild, they spend so much time hunting they have to save their energy for when they do the hunt and then eat and then sleep some more. I don't know what my cats are doing because I catch a lot more mice than they do. So I don't know. Peter talks about this lion that does not slumber or nap. The one that we're dealing with, the one that we're fighting against, he doesn't take a rest. He's always looking. He's always prowling. He's always looking for some prey. He says, be careful, watch out. Look out for the, the attacks from the enemy, your great enemy. Look out for him. He prowls around. He wants, to be, he wants to make you his victim. He is going to hell. He knows it. And he plans to take as many as he can with him. That's his whole goal. Take as many with them as he possibly can. He's sore about it. He's upset. He doesn't want to go. But he wants as much company as he can. He knows he's messed up. He knows salvation is not at all available to him or his fallen angels. And he wants to, he wants to take as many with him as he can. He knows he's defeated. He knows that he, he, he is going down. But he also knows that we have weaknesses. He knows we have buttons that, that he can push that cause us to stumble. He knows there's ways to make us lose hope. He knows there's ways that, 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 that can really interfere with, with, with us to the point that 
the point that we, we end up stumbling, we end up falling, we end up sinning. And he knows how to push those buttons. But Peter, he, he has this wisdom, he has this understanding, he's learned how to stand up against the enemy. He's learned how to stand and resist the enemy. And he wants to help us. He wants to show us that there's ways of doing this. Humility, self-control, and grace. These are the things that we walk in to be able to take a stand against the enemy. We've got to keep in mind who this Peter guy is. Peter's a fascinating Bible character. He's, he's so interesting. He was always quick to jump overboard. He was quick to, to be there, offer to do things. And he stood there, or he sat there at the upper room, <clears throat> As, as Jesus was saying that one of you is going to deny me. And Peter's like, no way, it's never going to happen. And Jesus turns and looks at him and says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. And before the rooster crows three times tonight, you will deny me. And Peter's like, no way, it's not going to happen. And Peter's like, it's, it's just not going to happen. Peter's just got this, this attitude that... that it's, it's, it's not possible. And then Peter went head to head with the enemy. He went head to head. He took him full on. And, and, and Peter crumbled. Peter got knocked down. The enemy put him in his crosshairs. And Peter failed. But the incredible part of it all is, is that Peter rose again, rose up again. Peter, Peter was forgiven. And then God had incredible, amazing things for Peter to do. He had an entire ministry for Peter to do. But Peter thought he could take on Satan himself. And we see how Peter learned how to battle the enemy. First thing he tells us in this passage is humility. Humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And in his good time, he will honor you. Give your worries and your cares to God for he cares about what happens to you. He's telling us that we need to be humble. Humble ourselves before the Lord. Peter wasn't humble when he was sitting in the upper room. He wasn't humble when Jesus says, Satan's asked to sift you as wheat. And Peter's like, no, it's not going to happen. No, I'm fine. Peter figured he could do it on his own. He's like, come at me, Satan. Let's see what happens. Well, we saw what happens. He denied him three times and then the rooster crowed. Peter was not walking in humility the night that Jesus was betrayed. On the night that Jesus was arrested. The night that he was standing there in that courtyard and, the, and, and he was being accused of being one of Jesus' followers. And he just... He figured himself he could do it on his own. I looked up the word humble in the dictionary and it doesn't come across with a positive, a positive tone. It's associated as being a humble home is something that's small, meaning something lesser, something that's below average. Humble means to be submissive. Humble means to be marked as simple. When people think of humbleness and being hu walking in humility, they see it as a negative thing. But Jesus doesn't see it as a negative thing. One that's humble allows somebody else to be in charge. Somebody that's humble realizes that it's okay to let somebody else's abilities, let somebody else's um, strength to help you through. It's okay to let somebody else take the step in front rather than us always having to be the one that's in the front, always having to be the one that's at the, that, that's at the foreground at all times. It doesn't mean that we think less of ourselves, it's that we think of ourselves less. If that makes sense. You don't think less of yourself. You think of yourself less. Which means other people are first. You let Jesus take the lead. You let Jesus fight the battle. You go along and you assist him. And let him fight the battle. It seems so complicated. How do we humble ourselves? 
Do we need to give something out? Give something up? Do we need to let go of something? We need to give our cares and our concerns and our worries over to the Lord. Humble ourselves and give it to Him. Put it on Him. He is, he is he's willing to carry it. He says that His burden is light. Let Him carry it. Let Him help us through it. How do we humble ourselves? We take all of our cares and worries and give them to Him. Peter took Satan on himself. Peter did it all by himself. He didn't have, well, Jesus was in the process of being arrested at the time, but he didn't look to the Father for help. He didn't look to, the, to Jesus for help. He did it all on his own, and it didn't go very well. Mary and Martha, you see, you see an example of, of one that, that's humbled themselves and focusing on Jesus, and the other one that's so focusing on the details and the, the worries and the concerns. That's one of the problems with, with VBS is we concentrate so much on the details, we focus so much on the, on the, the, the streamers and the stickers that you start to forget about the whole point of the message that has to be ready. Martha started to resent Mary because Mary was wasting her time. Mary was being lazy. Mary was being just, just sitting on the floor when she should have been helping. And then Jesus tells Martha, Mary's the one that's got it figured out. Mary has humbled herself and put herself at the feet of Jesus well, Martha is so worried and focusing on the details and flying around like a bee in a beehive. The enemy had completely distracted Martha of the most important part of all of it, that she had Jesus of Nazareth in her living room. And she was so worried about whether or not the rice was cooked rather than worrying about what Jesus was teaching. And Martha was resenting Mary over her growth with Jesus. We need to cast our cares and concerns and everything on to our Lord. Martha comes walking in and instead of looking for, for Jesus to sort out Martha's concern and upset, she goes walking in and says, reprimand her. Reprimand her. She wanted Jesus to stand up there and, and cause an issue rather than Jesus saying, listen, Martha, sit down. Let's have a visit. Let's look, listen to what I've got to say. Jesus tells us to cast our cares, cast our concerns, cast our problems and everything onto our Lord. This word cast means to throw upon, as in, as in a, like a pack animal, as in a donkey. Put everything on them. Put it on their weight. Put everything. Jesus wants our cares and concerns. He wants our worries. He wants all these things placed on top of him. He's willing to take them. Peter's telling us, give your cares and worries to God. He can carry them. Do we do this? How often do we give our concerns, give our worries? We, we go to him and say, it's all you, Lord Jesus, take care of it. And then uh, an hour later, we go and we, we take it back and worry about it again. We take it back and concern ourselves with it again. We, we, we make it all, about ourse all on ourselves again. We've taken it back. How often do we do this? We take them back. We just don't let the Lord take care of it. We worry about it after we've given it to him. How often do we know that if we gave it to the Lord, he will take care of it. He will take it to where it needs to be taken. He will take care of it. He will fix it. And yet, we, if we do give it to him, we then tell him how to fix it. We try to drag him along in the direction that we want him to go rather than just let the Lord sort it out. 
Do we let our Lord sort it out? Do we let him fix it? Do we take, let him take care of it? Or do we just carry it ourselves? Do we just worry about it ourselves? What my mom used to do on um, private practice, she used to go into people's homes that um, kind of before the whole um, PSW times, you'd have a registered nurse come to your house. My mom used to go and, and be with people so they could stay in their homes until they passed away. If they didn't want to go to a nursing home and they could afford it. So mom used to do a lot of private duty. And she had this, this, this person that was really, you know, they were, well, they were dying. And they were worried. They couldn't sleep. And they were just so worried, so worried, so worried. And worried about this and worried about that and worried about nothing. She finally just said to the person, she says, listen, my dad, which is my grandfather, he likes to worry about stuff. And he was always worried about something. He really likes to worry about stuff. How about I phone my dad? We can tell him the problem. He can worry about it for tonight. And you can get some sleep. Well, the person didn't go for it. They wanted to worry about it for themselves. But my grandpa was always worrying about stuff. And she tried to, tried to have the person pass it on to my grandpa to worry about. Because he'd be worried about something anyway. So just let him do it. That's how it's supposed to work. We're supposed to take our cares and concerns and our worries. When you're laying there at night and you know that you're, and, and you're just, you're, you're beside yourselves of, of something, give it to the Lord because he can take care of it. Just like my mom when she was kidding with the person about trying to give it to my grandpa to worry about, give it to Jesus because you know what? He's not going to worry about it. He's just going to deal with it. Hand it over to Jesus. Give it to him. Let him take care of it because he will. He'll take care of it. Give it to him. We don't need to carry the burden ourselves. We don't have to break our backs. We can give it to Jesus. Humble ourselves. Give it to him. Let him carry it. The second thing was be in control or be careful. First Peter verses, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be careful. Watch out for the attacks from the devil. Your great enemy, he's prowling around. He's like a roaring lion looking for a victim to devour. Take a firm stand and be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering as you are. We cannot slumber. We can't take a nap. We can't let our guard down. We can't forget the fact that he's out there. Yes, we've given our cares and our concerns to him. But we have somebody that's against us that wants to knock you down. So he's going to come at you in a different direction. We get used to him coming in one direction and we start to get used to it. We start to be able to stand against that. He always finds another way to try to knock you down. I was talking to Wolf before the service this morning and he says that anytime the enemy comes at him, he knows that there must be something that he's doing good for God because the enemy is trying to knock him down. The closer you get to God, the more you spend with God, the more you do for God, the more in tune you are with God, the more you're, you're, <laughs> the more you're doing for God, the more the enemy tries to slow you down and knock you down. That's just the way it is. Because if you're not doing anything for God and you're not a concern or worried for the enemy, what would be his need in coming at you? He's, he's already got you doing nothing, so it doesn't really matter anymore. But if you're doing something for God and you're working for God, then the enemy's going to come at you. I'm not telling you to start being lazy. I'm just telling you that once you, you, you've given it to the Lord, you've got to be ready because there's going to be something else you're going to have to give to him. Because the enemy's going to come at you in another direction. He's going to try to knock you down. Don't get so comfortable because he's hiding in the background. He's waiting. He's looking. He's trying to knock you down. Just be prepared. Be ready. Be careful. Be in control. You might think that the attacks are all over. You might think that the, the battle is finished. Then all of a sudden, bingo, he's on top of us again. Be ready, be watching, be prepared. Have a clear head, be watching. Lust. If Joseph, if Joseph had this, if he was constantly dwelling on lust, if he was constantly dwelling, dwelling on lustful thoughts, when, when Potiphar's wife showed up to try to drag him into that adulterous relationship, if his mind was completely on that, he would have been the first, he would have been right into it. They say they, they, start to, they talk to people that, um, 
that have affairs and they talk to people that that ministers that fall out of out of uh, ministry because of because of a um, an affair or something they when they get talking to them they say you know how did you get there how did it happen it was because they spent so much time dwelling on the scenarios and the the lust and everything before that they were already committing adultery because if you commit it commit it if you commit it in your heart You've already done it. They'd already done it in their heart long before they did it in the physical. We gotta, we gotta give those concerns over to the Lord and 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 let Him deliver us of them and forgive us. Materialism. If we're comp- constantly dwelling on how do I build my empire, how do I save this money, how do I make this bigger, how do I make this better? If I'm going dwelling so much on my empire and on my wallet and on my pocketbook, if that is your number one priority and that's all you think about is trying to make more and more and more when it comes to giving it to the Lord and, 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 and the Lord laying on your heart to, to share it. You're going to be so worried about if I don't have it in my own pocket, how am, where am I going to get it from? That we're less likely to give it to our Lord. Pride and jealousy We're so prideful and so full of ourselves and so concerned about succeeding ourselves and looking so much about being so great and everybody, look at me, look at me, look at me. That when somebody comes along that's doing well, are you able to encourage them? That was one of the biggest problems up in the north with the the pastor that we were working with. When we arrived, People accepted us. We got along with people. People, We were taken hunting. We were taken fishing. We were taken to, to do things. And people really, really got along with us well. And then he got really upset because he didn't want us to be accepted like that. He wanted to be accepted and I would help him become accepted more. He was looking for me to push him forward rather than me coming along beside him. And we had such a conflict because he got upset that people accepted us. And it's like, this is going to build the church. What's the problem here? And um, yeah, and it was a disaster. We need to be praying that we don't get so full of ourselves that we can't Share the joy with somebody else that's doing well. That's one of the biggest problems with with social media. I think that's quite interesting, Mike. Social media, on and on and on. People, pastors and preachers went on and on about social media being from the devil. It's terrible and everything like that. Then we get a pandemic and suddenly we're using social media to do ministry. Social media can have a positive twist. You can use it for ministry. But the thing is, is nobody wants to shine their problems to the world. And some people shine all their problems to the world. It's quite interesting. But they spend so much time staging their pictures to make it look so perfect. This whole Zoom call thing. Some people are so worried about the background, so worried about how it's all going to look because they want their life to look like it's so perfect and so together and so everything. When in reality, we've all got certain struggles. We've all got the enemy attacking us. Are we so full of ourselves that we don't want to allow our flaws to be seen? Are we so full of ourselves that when somebody else is doing well, we can't say, good for you, Jim. I'll be honest, his flower gardens look a lot better than ours. Especially since <laughs> I had this great idea. Our, our petunias were getting out of hand, Jim. It was like your hair is just like going full tilt. Anybody notice that Jim's not got his hair cut in a while? Isn't he looking like a, like a, a little bit like a hippie? You're going to be able to put that in a ponytail soon. Anyways, his, gar- his gardens are beautiful. And I got this great idea when I cut the grass last week. I was looking at him. I got my whippersnapper and I thought, I'm going to trim these a little bit. Don't do that with a whippersnapper. It doesn't work very well. Some of them died. <laughs> the trauma to the poor plants. So maybe you should use scissors. I don't know. Needless to say... Last night in the pouring rain, I was watering the garden because the rain was not hitting the garden because i got to get these things back now. 
but why would I go into that direction? I totally forgot. Anyways, I'm okay with saying, yeah, that's it. I'm okay with saying his gardens look better and his flowers look better and his, and, and, it's okay to say and to see somebody else's and look at the amount of hair on this guy. Like, that's great, isn't it? You know, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay to encourage somebody and tell them, you look amazing, Jim. Oh, I'm glad you don't have that tie on today. It makes me feel... <laughs> Marie's going to like this part because I'm not picking on her. <clears throat> we need to be in control. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your thoughts will also be. Is Jesus your treasure? Is that where you dwell your thoughts? Is that who you're putting first? Where is your treasure? Where is your heart? Where do you put all of your concerns and everything? Is your worry about your finances? Is your worry about how your neighbor's doing better or how you're doing better than them and you're trying to out, outdo them or look better than them or, or outpace them? Or where is your heart? Because where your heart heart is is where your treasure will be where your treasure is is where your heart will be you need to have the lord in both of those places he's got to be the one we're dwelling on he's got to be the one when you wake up in the morning that that's who the first one is you want to talk to unless your cat's awake i woke up yesterday to the cat standing on my chest staring at me in the face <laughs> So the, we don't know what the problem is, but the cat's head gets wet once in a while. And we don't know why, and we've Googled it, and we cannot find out why. But right on the top of his head gets wet, and we don't know what it is. We have no idea. It's not from his mouth. It's not from his ears. It's not from his eyes. Where is it coming from? We don't know. Well, he's standing there purring, looking at me in the face, and then he shook his head, and my face got wet. Okay. Needless to say, that was the beginning of my morning. <laughs> I was not dwelling on the Lord at that point <clears throat> when I was throwing the cat across the room. But we should be dwelling on the Lord. When you wake up that the Lord is the one you want to talk to first versus saying to the cat, get out of here. We should be waking up in the night wanting to spend the time with the Lord. Where our treasure is is where our heart and thoughts will also be. Where's the Lord in your heart? Where's the Lord in your, in your life? Is he number two to your cat? Is he number three? Is he number four? Is he number five? Where is he in your life? We need to put our hearts, well, thoughts, our dwelling, our treasure in him. Martin Luther said, The devil climbs over the fence where it is the lowest. Therefore, if stealing is your weakness, don't stay in a room where someone else's money is lying around unattended. If gossiping is a weakness, stop hanging around with the friends that are quick to spread the latest rumors. Don't allow ourselves to dwell in a place. It's like a it's like a recovering alcoholic becoming a bartender. Not a wise idea. Don't dwell in the place where your temptations are. Be in control. If you have something that you're easily tempted by, don't hang out there. Don't sit there and stare at it. Get out. Say no. Go and tell. And who do you tell? You tell your Lord. And then when the, when the Lord battled the enemy... When he went to war with them, he used scripture as his defense. He used scripture as his offensive and defensive weapon. Matthew 4, 4. No, scripture says people need more than bread for their life. They must feed on every word of God. That is not a profound passage. It's profound because Jesus used it. But really... People need more than bread. You must feed on the word of God. It's just a random passage in the word of God, but Jesus used it as a defense in a battle against the enemy. But he knew the word to be able to use it. Satan's trying to tell him to do one thing, and Jesus is like, I don't think so. Those proverbs, they're, they're battle words you can use. Psalms, you can use them as battle words. 
Matthew 4, 7, the scripture says, do not test the Lord your God. Matthew 4, 10, get out of here, Satan. You must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. How do we battle him? We battle him with the sword. What is the sword? The sword is the word of God. The only way you're going to be able to use the sword is if you know the sword. You need to spend time with the word of God. Get to know it. And then when the enemy comes at you, you just use scripture and say, get out of here. Serve the Lord your God and him only and you're not him. Get out. We've seen two things. Humbling ourselves. Being in control. And the next one is grace. God's grace. Humility is casting our cares on him. Self-control is preparing ourselves for the more temptations and attacks that are going to come. But grace is what carries us through all of this stuff. Sometimes I'm not very good at taking these instructions. Sometimes the temptations come and I dwell in them and I shouldn't be. I'm good at stumbling. I'm too good at getting too close to the fence. I'm good at dwelling on things that I should be resisting. But the exciting thing is, is we have a Jesus that will forgive us. I might fail. I might fall. But I serve a Jesus that went through the temptations. He went through the battles like we couldn't even imagine. And he overcame. How cool is that? In verse 10 it says, He will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. He will restore you. He will restore you. That means that if you do stumble, if you do crumble, if you do fall, he will restore you. He will put you back on a firm foundation. And the foundation is not built on Bob. The foundation is built on Jesus. And he is the rock that will not roll. He is the rock that will not crumble. And he's the foundation that will stand strong. Our neighbor's house, a little bit of oil spilled into the basement. So if you drive by and see like a... 25 foot, foot hole by 50 feet by like 60 feet it's because their furnace tank drained into their basement and it's a huge hole and we've been waking up to the morning to either the cat dripping on my face or the of an excavator digging and digging and digging we're thinking man there's going to be Chinamen coming into the bottom of that thing soon they're going to go all the way through the core of the earth but that house <laughs> It's going to be on a firm foundation when they're done because they're on solid rock now. Like, it's just, that is solid. And I don't know how much, they got rid of the excavator. I think they're done digging, in case you're wondering. But you can stand there and look through their, their, their fencing, and you can see the sheen of oil on the water down there. So I don't know how much further they have to go. But you need to build on a solid rock foundation. When they built this thing, they blasted. This building sitting on a foundation, the entire, on a rock, solid rock foundation. The only spot of this building that's not on a solid rock is about the 10 foot corner over here. The rest of it is all complete solid rock. And if you don't believe me, go stand beside the community sign. The rock is sticking out of the ground over there. We got to build on the solid rock. If you build it on sand, maybe it's too early to talk about the building in Florida. You build it on sand, sometimes they come crashing down. You got to build on solid rock. Solid rock. And then when the water comes rushing through the basement of this building and we pump it out with the, su with the sub pumps, we know the foundation's not going to go anywhere. And Glenn and I dug it up. Not with shovels, we used tobacco. But we dug it up and we checked out the foundation and it's just fine down there. Just got some water around it and we got rid of the water. But it's not going, the foundation didn't go anywhere. But if you have water underneath sand, it erodes. My driveway keeps having a sinkhole. Every spring, I have a sinkhole. It's about that big around, and it goes down about a foot to two to three feet. And it just, poof, and it just goes down. And I keep thinking, one of these days, I'm going to drop my car tire in there because it just suddenly is there. They, a house drove by our house the other day with a big transport truck in front of it, and they put their front tire right over the spot that the sinkhole always happens because there's a creek underneath my driveway. And I keep calling your son. 
I called Danny and say, oh, I got my sinkhole back. And he's like, all right, I'll send the guys. And I said, yeah, the dirt's going somewhere. Where's it going? We're going to need to dig it up one of these years. And they go and they fill it in. It takes care of it. And it's good for the next, uh, next spring. But when it's on sand, when it's on a soft foundation, it crumbles and it falls. We need to be restored and put onto Jesus because he's the one that'll carry our burdens and he's the one that will be this foundation underneath us to be that strength after we've been restored. So if you do stumble, if you do fall, if you do crumble under the temptation, he can and will restore you. This guy, Satan, he's got a lot in this game. He knows, he knows he's defeated. He knows he's got a problem on his hands. He knows that he's going down. The enemy, he knows what his future is. He knows scripture as well as you do. He knows that the bottomless pits ahead. He knows that the abyss is for him. He knows that it was built for him, for him and his devil and his demons. He knows it's all for him and he knows that he's going. He knows he's going to be bound. He knows he's going to be released. He knows he's going to be going back. He's going to be there for eternity. And he wants to take as many people with him as he can. Matthew 25, 41, Then the king will turn to those on his left and say, Away from you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. That's who it was built for. And he knows that that's where he's going. And he wants to take you with him. So he's going to try to tempt you every chance he can. He's going to come from you different angles. It says, When the enemy comes in like a flood, we need to raise the standard up against him. You ever been near a flood? This building, when it flooded last spring, it didn't flood from the outside in. It actually flooded from the water that's underneath this building up through the floor is where it came from. It came up out of the floor. Mind you, the sub pump failing and shooting it across the basement didn't help. But it came up out of the floor. When the enemy comes in like a flood, he can come from the sides, he can come from underneath, and he can come from the top. We don't know what angle or direction he's coming from. That's why we've got to be ready and prepared and don't let our guards down. And then give those cares to the Lord and let him deal with it because he's the foundation and the one carrying that we need. John 16, 33, I have told you this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you'll have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome this world. There's going to be trials. It's one of the promises. There's hundreds of them. One of the promises is trials and temptations will come. But it's okay. He has had the victory. Not, not going to have the victory. He has the victory. He's already fought the battle and he's already won. And we can rely on him and he will bring us through it. And you've got to keep in mind the enemy is the accuser. He loves to accuse us of something. You stumble and fall five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. The enemy keeps bringing it up. Hey, Bob, do you remember when you? And he brings it up. And he accuses you. And he tells you you're no good, tells you you're useless, tells you you're no, you, you, you failed. Like, why would God love you? Why would anybody else love you? Why would Jim love you? And next thing you know, you're just in this pit of despair again because the enemy's accusing you of something that's already under the blood. Jesus has already forgiven you. He's already forgotten about it. He doesn't want you to remind him because he's already forgotten about it. He's already forgiven you. And it's as simple as that. Jeff, you've been forgiven. Leave it behind and let's move on. That's one of the cares we lay on the shoulders of the Lord. When the enemy comes and reminds us of what we did of our past, we give it to the Lord, you remind the enemy of his future, and you go on, which is easy to say when you're not in the middle of it. In Revelations uh, 12, 10, for the accuser has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses our brothers and sisters before the Lord day and night. That's what he does. He convinces, he talks you into, he, he tempts you, he causes you to stumble, and then he goes and accuses you of what you've done. It's just like a kid in the, in the playground, don't you think? 
It's funny because <laughs> I've been working on VBS and I've been working on my Bible lessons and I keep expecting certain slides to pop up, but that's like Tuesday's Bible lesson. It's not, it's not in this. Because <clears throat> I have a picture of a kid being bullied by another kid in the background and they're pointing at the kid laughing at them and that wasn't the next slide. Peter knows what it's like to stumble, but he also knows what it's like to be restored to the Lord and placed on that foundation. This is not just somebody that's talking from a theoretical point of view. This is a guy that was told, Satan has asked to shake you up like a, like a can of paint in a paint shaker. It's essentially what that means. It's, it's like the idea of a salt shaker shaking to get the contents on the inside out. That's what the word means, sift you as wheat. Sifting as wheat is when they take the wheat and they put it on a blanket and they pound the daylights out of it with a, with a stick and they throw it in the air so the shaft flies away and the wheat stays. Satan has asked to put you on a blanket, pound the daylights out of you with a stick, make the chaff fly away and all, your, all that's left is your insides laying there on the ground. And that's what Jesus says to Peter. <clears throat> kind of graphic, isn't it? And Jesus responds with, and I've prayed, after you come back. Not that it doesn't happen, it's that when you come back, you'll be stronger because you got work to do. Peter fell. Peter went head to head with Satan himself. You and I, we just get the, 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 the lackey demons. He got Satan himself come at him, and he failed. But when Jesus rose from the dead, one of the very, very first statements of after Jesus is risen from the dead, he says, now go and tell, oops, sorry, this was the angel saying this. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of them to Galilee and you will see there just as he told you before he died. Make sure you tell Peter, because Peter's in a pit of despair right now because he has, he's been crying all weekend because he's denied Jesus three times. And, and the Lord wants Peter to know, Peter, Peter, it's okay. Jesus has risen from the dead. And then Peter sees Jesus and everything's going well and all of a sudden they're out fishing and Jesus shows up on the shore. Peter jumps out of the, wa out of the boat. He he jumped out of boats as fast as he would jump into the boats. He jumps out of the boat, swims to shore, and Jesus has got lunch there, or breakfast there for them. He's sitting there, and Jesus says to me, Simon, son of John, or Peter, says to him, do you love me more than these? And Jesus restores Peter, restores him, puts him back in his place, puts him back in his place of, 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 of being, the, being an apostle. Puts him back in his place of, of responsibility. Puts him back, restores him, forgives him. Puts him on the firm foundation. Peter knew what it's like to accept and experience the forgiveness of the Lord. How do we resist the devil? Humble ourselves. Cast our cares and concerns to the Lord. Let him worry about it. Don't let it consume you. Be in control of your thoughts. Don't dwell on the things that are your temptations. Don't sit there and stare at somebody's wallet that's sitting on the table. Don't sit there and spend all this time thinking, I can steal that or I can do that or I can, I can take advantage of this person. Don't live where your weaknesses are. Give them over to the Lord and trust in the grace of God for the strength to overcome and the faithfulness to forgive you when you fall. And regardless of the roar that the enemy might give out, remember he's no more powerful than some little kitten that has really no bite, no strength, and their claws aren't even sharp yet. He might accuse you of something, but you have been forgiven if you've given it over into the blood of the Lamb. Allow the Lord to carry your burdens and concerns. Allow him to lead you. Jesus is in control. And watch out 
Watch out for the enemy coming because he's going to come. Just give your cares over to him. And don't dwell in that place when the temptation comes. That's what a lying lion looks like. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, God, for this day. We thank you, God, for all that you are. And I pray, God, you help us to not to live in that state of worry. I pray, Lord God, that we don't live in a state of looking at and, and, and desiring that temptation. Heavenly Father, help us to, to realize that, that <clears throat> we don't need to, we don't need to, to, to fight the enemy ourselves, but we can rely on our Lord because he is our strength. I thank you, Jesus, for how great and awesome and incredible you are, Lord Jesus. Oh, Heavenly Father, be high and lifted up. And I pray, Jesus, that we will just draw close to you, Lord. I pray, God, when the temptations come, help us to say no and go and tell. I pray, Lord Jesus, that when the temptations come, that we will, that we will not live in that temptation. We will not dwell in that temptation, but we will leave that temptation behind. We will get away from the fence. That we won't hang out near where it's happening. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you help us to cast our cares and concerns and worries and everything, cast them upon you, Lord, and let you hang on to them and keep them. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, God, for how great you are. Jesus, be high and lifted up. Jesus, be glorified. Oh, we thank you. We thank you for your glory, Lord God. I pray, Jesus, that you just draw us closer to yourself. And I pray, Jesus, that when we do stumble, when we sin, when we fall short, I pray, Lord Jesus, that we remember that we don't need to live in a place of despair, but we can live in a place of victory and forgiveness. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we will seek you for forgiveness and we will dwell on you and that you will be where our heart and our treasure is, not in our earthly possessions, not in our, our, our jealousies and prides and lusts, but I pray, Lord Jesus, that we dwell in you and in your word. Oh, Jesus, be glorified, be high and lifted up. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' holy and precious and glorious name, in Jesus' name, amen.